Okay, well, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Hero Makers Podcast Season 3. And I'm very excited about our podcast today because we're going to be talking about reading and books and a little bit of the arts, kind of dabbling in the arts a little bit and writing and just stuff that um, you guys know is close to my heart. I wish that I had more time to read, Anne. Like it's, I have all these books that are on my bucket list and my mom is the most, the most um, incredible reader. Like every time I go over there, she has books on her shelf, like it's like big books, biographies, fiction, uh, nonfiction, mystery. She like dabbles in all this stuff. And are you a big reader? I don't think I know this about you. I would love to be as well more. Um, I'm reading more for work purposes, which is not as much fun, mm-hmm. but January 6th, I'm actually being called for jury duty, (laughs) which who knows if I'm selected because then you're not allowed to have any electronic tablets or phones or so me in a book or me in a real awesome journal for me to start writing and processing 2021, which I think is really important as well. Well, or I guess unless the uh, the whole process takes one day and then, <laughs> then you're like, that was the shortest retreat ever. That I took. Or I could be rejected and that's okay too. Or you could be rejected, which is both good and bad. I don't know what to yeah. say. To yeah, but um, okay. So, and let's introduce our guest, Latanya Devon. And I'm excited because Latanya, you are in the Bronx and the last New York person that we had on here, I think was someone named Hector Guadalupe, if you guys remember him, way back in season one. And Latanya, he founded this organization called Second You Foundation. He was formerly incarcerated and then he helps people now to um, who are coming out of being behind bars and he helps them to inter- find jobs, integrate back into society. It's incredible, but I realize it's been a what whole year. Name? Hector what? Guadalupe. Oh, you got to send me his information um, because I do want to work with uh, families with an incarcerated parent and bring literacy into, um, you know, in in a way that connects them to the family unit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll definitely connect you with him. So, um, but that was like way, way back. He's like episode 14 or something like that. But um, Latanya, so we're going to be talking to you about this incredible thing that you have going on called Bronx Bound Books which is a mobile bookstore that you started during COVID times. And- No, I started it before COVID in 2019. Oh, good. Oh, wait, 2018? 19. 19, so a year before. So we're gonna talk about like how Mm -hmm. COVID has impacted you and all that. But um, Latanya, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking, Lori. It's good to have you on. Latanya, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? And, um, you know, did you grow up in the Bronx and a little bit about kind of your life growing up and then we'll kind of move to what you're doing now? Sure. Um, I am uh, born and raised in the Bronx. I was raised by my grandmother from um, two days old. I was adopted by her. Mm -hmm. I uh, grew up loving books, always to read. I would buy books at... uh, the Strand Bookstore, which is a secondhand bookstore here in New York. They sell new and used books. So I'm inspired by the fact that I was able to afford books that weren't at, you know, Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> and um, my love for used books, and I, I really found value in them as well. I would go to farm um, hmm. uh, garage sales and buy books as well when my, my, my aunt would pick me up and take me to New Jersey. So while everyone was looking for clothing and like China and furniture. I was over there looking at the books. Um, my grandmother was also an educator. She taught uh, in first grade. She um, would read to her neighbors that couldn't read for themselves. So she would read their, their leases and their prescriptions. And I would just wake up on a random Saturday and see someone at, you know, sitting in my living room and she was helping them by reading the information that they couldn't read for themselves. So seeing that really made me realize that um, reading is very important. It's a matter of life and death in some cases. Yeah. Do you remember what some of the books that were formative for you growing up, what a few of those were? I should not have been reading them. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading VC girls. I was devouring those books like one a day. Um, I was just intrigued by uh, the way they operated as a family. You know, I was just interested 
how other people um, lived, you know, how siblings interacted, which wasn't a, the greatest example. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, drama and, and incest and controversy and mm. child abuse in those, in those books. Uh, I ran into Stephen King's um, Pet Cemetery mm -hmm. and I read up to a certain point and I had to close the book. He's such an amazing writer. It felt like I was in the book and it scared me so bad. I couldn't even look at the cover. So I never finished Pet Cemetery <laughs> mm -hmm. because Stephen King scared the living Jesus out of me. <laughs> well, Tanya, I remember um, George R. R. Martin um, he's, an, he's an author and he once said something like a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, but the person who doesn't read lives only one. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that you're talking about, that you're talking about like reading these books that you shouldn't have been reading, right? That you're kind of like entering this world that wasn't your reality, but you still found fascinating. And mm -hmm. what, what have you learned like over the years in terms of like books and what they could kind of why they're important for all of us, like all of us to have these different storylines that we enter and lives through biography or whatever they are. I believe that books, uh, I know you've probably heard it before, but they're either a window or a mirror mm. to either you find yourself in them or you can peek into another world, into another lifestyle and to understand the world around you and to understand yourself. And there, there's so much information that you can find in books to help you navigate the world you live in. And even when you travel somewhere else or when you, let's say you go to college and you read something in a book and you were able to relate to, to your, to your um, roommate because you knew a little bit about their culture. I remember um, in college, I took a world religion class and the books that were in that class really opened my mind to other religions other than, you know, um, Christianity or, um, you know, someone being Muslim. So I, I was able to learn about Confucius and um, Taoism and uh, Buddhism from a different perspective because I was actually learning about the religion without actually having to practice it. Yeah. So um, I have in HR so when you're working with other people in, a, in big corporations people from all walks of life come through the door for help and knowing a little bit about their culture helps me understand why they need this break to go pray at a certain time or you know oh this person's missing oh what time is it oh he's, he's probably praying or you know he is praying or, or something like that so um it just helps it reading this just so much information it's an unlimited amount of information you can learn and you can use to navigate, really. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of reminded of a, of maybe um, it making us better, like cultural anthropologists or sociologists, that we can learn mm -hmm. more about. Yeah, the people because it makes us better people, right? It's not just for learning purposes, but how we, you know, how we live. But okay, so Latanya, let's. Okay, so you dabbled in HR, but I think I read too, like you worked at a historical society and different things. So walk us through kind of like the different um things that you've done in terms of like jobs or you know kind of leading up to realizing that you wanted to own a bookstore as well what have you dabbled in what have been the different things I've always wanted to own a bookstore I just didn't know how. I didn't know I could I never saw anyone that looked like me um own a bookstore the bookstores that I was going to you know um the Strand bookstore was huge Barnes and Noble huge Borders. I never met the CEO or the owner of these corporations. So I just thought it was just like another business where someone else had to do it. I have a background in uh, finance. I've worked in the accounting offices at um, nonprofits. I've worked at the New York Historical Society. I, um, my most recent job um, that I lost because of COVID was at uh, Eli Zabar, which is a bread company and bakery and restaurant here in New York. Um, I know they have a few other locations as well, but I was working in HR and I lost my job there because of COVID. I was always juggling barn, um, Bronx bound books and another job and COVID really allowed me the time to really focus on it 
I started Bronx Town Books um, back in 2019 with a business reveal that happened on May 5th, 2019. And I thought like 10 people would show up and about 115 showed up and it was raining and cold, a very cold uh, spring day, but um, people showed up and they were eager to learn about what Bronx Bound Books actually was. Those who knew me knew that I always wanted to own a bookstore. And when I started to move forward towards uh, Bronx Bound Books, they didn't know that it would be a bookstore on wheels. Mm. So I would um, let them know what I was going for and how Bronx Bound Books will operate during that event. That is so cool. I really feel like, I mean, I feel like we should just go for coffee and just talk forever, but like, <laughs> it's interesting that you have a background as well in HR. You just, it sounds like you're just so interested in knowing about people, not just on a surface level, but on a more deeper level. <clears throat> so I have, you, um, go ahead. I've posted, oh, I'm sorry. I posted open mics and writing workshops and I'm, <laughs> I've always been interested in, in someone's story. And I always felt like every story that I've come across should be heard. You know, I think that um, if you have something to say, you should say it. And I believe in uh, allowing space for those who have something to say or want to have something to say. So in the open mics, I would notice that people would come to me and they're like, wow, that was so cool. That poem that someone else did. I write a little bit, but I just don't know how to perform it. So I said, okay, now it's time to do a writing workshop. So usually the people in the community tell me what's next for me as far as my community work is concerned. That's interesting. So you're listening, you're kind of listening to people around you to find mm -hmm. your next thing. Um, tell us about the open mic, LaTanya. What is that about? The open mic uh, was a poetry and, and music and, you know, um, creative expression, really. It was called Urban Voices Heard. Um, right out loud. I started in Manhattan and I was walking in my neighborhood one day and I saw a bookstore appear out of nowhere. I didn't, I didn't get a notice that there was a bookstore coming to my neighborhood. I didn't get anything from my kids' school telling me that a bookstore was coming. And I walked in and I saw my son's teacher there. And I'm like, Miss Harris, did you know this bookstore was here? And she's like, yes, I own it. So my son's, <laughs> my son's teacher owned the bookstore. Um, she started it a year before her retirement. Um, it was called Books in the Hood Bookstore right near our, our home. So that was the point where I realized that, hey, my grandma was a teacher and she was a regular person. Not that teachers are regular because I think they are extraordinary beings, but it was someone that I, I knew if I wanted to become a teacher, I could become a teacher because I was able to see that my grandmother was a teacher. So I believe in see it, be it. If you, if you see something for the first time or if you've never seen something, I think that it inspires you to uh, become it. So I saw Ms. Harris and I, you know, for a little while I said, you know what, Ms. Harris got this, you know, she has a bookstore. I'll just live vicariously through her. So I brought my open mic to her bookstore every second Saturday of the month. And people came from all over to support her, but she couldn't um, keep the doors open because gentrification is really um, taking a toll on the mom and pops here in the Bronx. So I didn't want that to happen to me. So that's what really kept me from opening up a brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to a friend, Vanessa, one day, and she's like, well, you know, this is I don't know how many jobs this is already because I would quit jobs because I just wasn't um, happy um, or I was too comfortable. So two things were guiding me, the comfort at a day job. And I realized that that fire that lived inside of me to create or to be in community wasn't there. And I realized that that, that was missing. So um, I was talking to her and she's like, well, it sounds like you're about to quit another job. What are you gonna do? You should just open this bookstore. And another friend, she said, you know, the next job you get has to be your bookstore. And um, again, listening to those around me and them listening to me and re <laughs> reminding me that, you know, I have this passion um, because life gets in the way. You know, sometimes you, not everyone gets a chance to, to live out their dreams. And it's because, you know, things just happen. And before you know it, that time, you know, is over. For us. So I didn't want to leave this earth 
not that I have any terminal illnesses or anything like that, thank goodness. But while I'm here, I want to be able to um, finally live my dream. So I started Bronx Found Books and here we are. <laughs> you know, Latanya, this, I think a lot of people are in your situation where they're, they kind of have these latent dreams that they don't really realize how they can come to fruition. And right now, you know, in the midst of COVID, you hear about this great resignation that's happening and people are quitting their jobs and going mm -hmm. to different jobs and just trying to figure out their way in the world. And we had, Latanya, we had interviewed um, another person on this podcast who had said that if you don't build, it's kind of, it was around these lines. If you don't build your own dreams, then you're basically going to help somebody else build theirs. That's what and, I say all the time. Yes. I and was I think to work. I'm sorry. I was coming to work to um, fuel someone else's legacy while mine was just, wasn't even lit. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think what I want people to hear in your story is that when you have a dream, like we can float from thing to thing. And sometimes we have to because of financial reasons or whatever they are. But how can we find a creative way to get to our dream, to get to what we feel like we were made here to we were made to do. And what I love about what you shared about your teacher, your, your son's teacher, is that I think you said that she was a year away from retirement. And so it's kind of like the second calling that sometimes we have to pivot into as well. Um, and then I was going to ask you about why mobile, why not a brick and mortar, but you had said it was because of partially because of financial security that you wanted for this. So, so tell us about um, okay, so you realize I can have a bookstore in my community. And then tell us about the process of finding a vehicle that would accommodate your needs and kind of how you did that financially, how that was possible mm -hmm. and kind of building that dream. Walk us through that. So first you were talking about um, how people can um, follow their dreams, I think first yeah. you open with that mm -hmm. uh, I think the most pain and discomfort happens when you're in between so either you decide to do it or you don't I believe that uh, it's like a rubber band the most friction is in between the rubber band when you're pulling it from both ends and until it pops that's when the the, the friction ends mm -hmm. so I think when you're making these decisions to do what you want, you have to either honor that or let it go mm -hmm. or start building towards doing it because um, being on the fence is painful. Mm -hmm. um, you just, just got to make a decision. You got to move. Even if it's a baby step in the direction, you have to, you have to choose. You have to make the choice because um, when you show up for work, it's going to be on your conscience. Anything that you do that's not what you want to do will feel heavier. That's what I believe. And you're just not going to be as happy or feeling as fulfilled um, on your, during your day to day. Um, owning a bookstore is not an easy task. But the trials and, and, and the tribulations that I've experienced really is worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Um, my community reminds me that it's worth it because they show up for me as well. Um, I used my savings to buy the bus. Um, I did a lot of research. At first it was going to be a school bus. And I realized that during COVID um, where I received a grant from Lowe's Home Improvement, I was able to purchase the bus with my savings and renovate the bus. But um, during my research, I started to look up um, people who live in um, buses, <laughs> the schoolies, and I saw someone convert uh, a shuttle bus. So it's like an accessory bus. I'm not sure if you know what a shuttle bus is, but um, yep. the white ones. Yep. Uh, the reason why he, he converted that was because of the way the mechanics was of that bus, how it was. I didn't need a special mechanic to look at it as opposed to having a school bus where someone who specializes in school buses would be the best place for you to take it. So I said, okay, access to a great mechanic would be easier 
than um, getting a school bus. And it's um, COVID, it was during COVID, um, election day 2020, when I purchased the bus. And there weren't that many um, mechanics open. And if they were, they were all booked because people were getting their cars fixed after not being able to be out as much as before. The person that sold the bus to me was um, transporting kids back and forth to school and he lost his contract with um, the school he was working with due to COVID because the kids were um, learning remote and it was too, too expensive for him to keep it. Um, I also learned during my research that the bus that I purchased runs really great right up until 500,000 miles, you know, and I think that um, longevity was something that I, I really wa was interested in finding a bus that would really last a long time if I was going to invest money into repairing it and converting it into a, um, a bookstore. So it took some Google searches and some vision boards and um, looking at similar designs and then uh, finding a company to, to take the seats out and start the conversion. And I found one in the Bronx. That is so cool. Thank you. I feel like that even just explaining it might just seem really easy and obvious to you, but for other people, it would be really helpful just to hear your process. And even like with the Lowe's grant and then also your vision boards and trying to figure out the right, the right vehicle even is really important. Um, so the Lowe's grant was for $20,000 and I did savings. So I did um, use my savings to purchase the bus and use the Lowe's grant to convert it. Um, I went in there with a concept in mind. I wanted, um, since it was a, it's a small space, I wanted it to feel um, spacious. So the floors are like light, a light color. And so the ceilings to give the illusion of it being a wider space. I learned that through watching design shows and all the, <laughs> all those DIY shows. Growing yeah. up, actually, you know, I would watch, you know, all these makeover shows, um, tiny house and things like that. So. I didn't know I was storing information to help me <laughs> in the future. <laughs> We're all doing research, all We're those all DIY shows. So I wanted to uh, focus a little bit on your vision boards. And I mean, I think mm -hmm. that was probably for the physical space, but I was so curious about, you know, I feel like you're really responsive to people. And so even having a mobile bookstore is you're responding to the people, right? <laughs> so- um there's only one brick and mortar bookstore in the Bronx. Oh, wow. So for a little while, we didn't have a bookstore, period. Well, Tanya, Antonio how many people and, live in, in the Bronx? Uh, 1.7 million. What? Wow, and one bookstore. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Yes. Um, for a little mm -hmm. while, we didn't have a bookstore, period. Barnes & Noble left, and it wasn't for three, I think three years, three or four years before we, we had another bookstore. And myself and the other bookstore, we, we opened a little bit around the same time. So um, that's huge. responding to my community, yeah. I didn't wanna be a person that was just sitting around complaining that there wasn't a bookstore. So I started to like, okay, this is, it's time to do it. It's time, it's not like it's something that wasn't in mind already. So it wasn't really a response per se, to our circumstance where, you know, I believe every neighborhood deserves a bookstore, even if it's just for one day. So that's why it's mobile. If I can open up a bookstore in every neighborhood in the Bronx, I would, but I could barely afford to open one, you know, in one neighborhood. And um, there's so many different things that keeps people from going to a bookstore in general. And now because of COVID, people tend to just go to school, go to the doctor, go to the supermarket, maybe a little bit clothes shopping and going to the bookstore may not necessarily be in route so if I can um have the bus you know along the way you know in someone's neighborhood um we uh we partnered with another community organization that was giving away food they rented the bus and with the bu bus rental the books are free so we parked in front of someone's apartment building. Could you imagine just going down to your apartment just to go to a bookstore and then someone else covered your tab? Uh, so these amazing. kids were like 
what? They were coming out of there with all the Percy Jacksons and the diary with the wimpy kid and things like that. And the parents were able to purchase books for themselves. And, you know, another community organization um, paid for that experience. Okay, so Latanya, I have so many questions about this. I have <laughs> questions about what does, okay, what is logistically it look like to serve 1.7 people in the Bronx? Like, do you have a regular route that you cover in a week? Um, do you try to hit certain areas? Is there a certain demographic that you're aiming for in terms of kids, adults? Like, give us a little insight into logistically what this looks like. So we partner with schools. Um, I have a book fair where it's, uh, it's a book fair because it's a fair about books, but there are no purchases being made. The books are prepaid. So I selected the books, um, the school approved it, and every student is able to go home with a book that day, a tote bag and a bookmark um, for the holiday. Um, but they asked for it to be uh, multicultural and diverse books as far as, you know, sexual orientation and um, culture and things like that. Um, that's one event. Um, so the, the school request, uh, I sell books at farmer's markets. I'm at the Bronx Botanical Garden on Wednesdays during the summer. Um, I meet so many educators there, so many people from all over come there. It's a tourist attraction. Um, I do farmer's markets. I said that already. And I could partner with a community organization um, this December, um, a business improvement in our area. Uh, in the Bronx, rented the bus for three days for a holiday giveaway. They said, you know, in the past, they haven't had a really good experience giving away toys because, you know, everyone has a preference, a color, or there's just so many different things. So um, they wanted to give out books. So they rented it in one week and I'll be at different locations in the bid, the business improvement district they cover and elected officials also rent the bus and contribute to um, supporting that way mm -hmm. so that their constituents can, you know, have access to books. So there are various different ways mm -hmm. and people get really creative as far as <laughs> like um, how to get the Bronx Bound Book Bus to their school or their community organization. Another organization um, rented the bus. Um, they were giving away food to a shelter yeah. and I was able to park the bus in front of the shelter and you know the residents at the shelter were able to purchase books you know shelters get books all the time but to bring a bookstore and have them select their own books is a it's so powerful because it's not just some books that were just left over and these are for the people in the shelter this is an actual bookstore with recent titles um not so recent titles new and used books they would see at, at, at a regular bookstore yeah. or on the New York Times bestsellers list or you know on social media so these are popular and current books that um people actually want yeah yeah so that, that was another question I had is how do you pick the titles that I mean is it basically you're doing oh. the research plus historic like classics plus diversity like do you have a checklist that you're like hey we have to have so many titles of this how does that mm -hmm. work so um, for school events, it's usually, uh, I'll ask for teachers input and the teachers are so busy. Um, sometimes they'll give me some input, but I'm a, constant, I'm, I'm a bookstore. So I'm getting emails about what's coming and who's writing a book and when it's coming out. Um, we have a bookshop. I see what people are buying there. Uh, I get emails. And if I get enough requests about a certain book, I'll bring them in. Um, I meet with publishers just like any other bookstore owner or I'm the one person that, that works at the bookstore, but um, I wear many hats. So I'm also the buyer. Yeah. And you know I talk to the sales reps at publishing companies. I attend all kinds of workshops and, and events to just learn as much as I can about um, the publishing cycle of a book. So I can also tell other people and I also learn about what's coming and what's, what, what'll be a good sellers and things like that. Um, as far as used books, I select them very, very carefully. Um, 
sometimes people can't even believe that they're buying a used book. When I sell it to them, uh, I let them know, hey, this is a pre-owned or previously loved book. And they're like, what, are you kidding me? This just came out or it's in such great condition. So I really pride myself in having a book that you'd be proud to read, even if it's a, a used book. So it's not like that section over there is the like used book section. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have um, new books on display, but I also have used books on display as well. Um, books from you know various artists and various writers. Uh, farmers markets tend to have a lot of families. So I do sell a lot of children's books, a lot of picture books and things like that. Yay. I want to come visit your bookstore. Okay, or, me too, me too. Um, I was just looking up the Bronx on my map because I was like, you have a botanical garden? I didn't even know. <laughs> anyway, so mm -hmm. okay, I it's just gorgeous. To Is it? I'm sure. I need to come back and visit. Um, is there a particular person or a story that you could share of like who's been impacted through your through your bookstore? Mm -hmm. I could tell stories for days. Um, an elder, he came to me at a book distribution where someone else paid for the books. And he's like, hey, are these books free? I'm like, yeah, today the books are free. He's like, well, do you have anything easy? Because, you know, I'm just learning how to read. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, I happen to be at the right place at the right time to be able to, you know, offer him what he was looking for so he can continue his, you know, his learning journey. Um, he was uh, older than me. He was an elder. Um, a woman at a at ten of garden was like, my son does not like to read. Do you have anything that he would like? And I suggested um, Class Act by Jerry Craft. And she emailed me at three o'clock in the morning and said, I just walked past my son's room and he's still reading that book. He loves it. Um, there's so many um, watching the kids um, leave the bus with a pile of books. And I used to look the same way when I went to the Barnes, um, to uh, the Strand bookstore. <laughs> I would come home with more books that I could carry. Um, you know, it, I can, I realize the, the impact almost every time I'm out. So it's, the impact is in my face constantly. So I can't, you know, I, I'm really grateful that I don't question myself at night when I come home you know, because the, the impact and the, the response is immediate. Latanya, well, have you been able to feature any local writers, like any um, Bronx based writers who are either published through a publishing company or self published? A public? mm -hmm. I'm actually going to start an event, um, a series called Auth Authorpreneur. Yeah. It's a, um, I'm not, like I said before, I'm learning so much that can help the independent author and I'm going to invite people from the publishing industry to give advice as far as you know anything from book cover or you know layout to whatever the um the up-and-coming author needs to be able to have um you know a better chance of succeeding in their in their journey yeah I think so that's I a great idea yeah because I think I mean you're in some ways you're in a great position to serve as a mentor for up and coming writers and kind of give them a little bit of a, a local platform um, in that way, which is amazing. Um, Latanya, what, what have you learned about yourself in this whole venture that maybe was surprising to you? Like Latanya 10 years ago versus Latanya today? Um, I learned that I can do anything I put my mind to, to it. I, if I put my mind to it, I can do it. I can achieve it. I knew it before because I've made some, <laughs> some amazing choices and just came through somehow, some way. But um, I learned how um, determined I, can, I, I really am. I had some issues with the, um, the conversion, uh, the company, they said they would, the turnaround would be two to four weeks. They took 90 days. So I learned how to advocate for myself as a businesswoman. Uh, I leaned on my community. You know, I'm a mom, I'm a single mom of three. 
and I'm used to doing things on my own. I've been on my own since I'm 19 and I've, I've had a very, um, I've been, uh, I've walked a very tight rope with, with no net. So I've always been self-reliant and for the first time, and I think forever, I let my community um, support me as far as even the, doing the GoFundMe was hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I was selling books at a farmer's market, you know, um, on Saturdays outside of a high school. And I said, well, I'm just going to earn the money to, for the bus. I'm not going to do a social media um, campaign or anything like that. And I received the grant. And then I realized that, hey, I'm going to need a little bit more um, help. And uh, going back to advocating for myself, um, I was talking to a friend about the trouble of going through the issues with the contractors. And she said, won't you tell your story? I said, no one's going to want to hear that. And I'm like, and she's like, no, I think you tell your story. She, uh, I told my story on my personal social media page. And that post went viral and um, people were pitch, you know, emailing me and texting me, mm-hmm. how could they help? And then it caught the attention of New York One. And thanks to Amy Yancey on in New York One, um, she, she lit fire <laughs> under their butts and they moved along and the turnaround was a week after um, the story aired. And they also gave me a $4,000 discount because of the trouble. Wow. Wow. Latanya, there are so many lessons in your story. Like, I mean, now you're talking about um, just like telling your story too, as a way to have other people come alongside and do their part and so, so much good stuff. And, and you threw in the fact that you're a single mom of three, which is incredible, Latanya. I have a 17 year old, a 13 year old and a four year old. And a four, wow, those are like, that's a very big age difference too. Oh yeah. <laughs> 17 and four. But you can't tell the four, the, the four-year-old that, you just can't. <laughs> <laughs> the four-year-old thinks that he could do, or she could do anything the 17-year-old can, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, they can um, do it, mom, why can't I, right? So. Yeah, so, and then um, someone in my community also reminded me, because uh, I, I was having issues with the contractors and I was bummed out and I would go to a different event and my energy was different. And this one person told me, his name is Ron, he has um, a book club. And he said, you know, Latanya, you probably heard this before and you probably, everyone's probably been consoling you and I know you're tired of hearing it. But he said, I wanna tell you something. He said, when you're doing something good for the community, they'll wait. Your community will wait. Your community believes in what you're doing and they'll understand. And I'd never heard that before. Mm. And they waited, (laughs) they waited. And and when I came out with the bus for a soft launch, um, they were there ready and willing to experience the bookstore on wheels. And I didn't wanna wait for perfection. Also, it's another thing, nothing is gonna be perfect. The bus is still not painted on the outside. I'm still raising money to paint the outside. And then now it's cold. I have to wait a little longer. So <laughs> I knew I was patient, but I am really. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so Latanya, let's let's kind of wrap up there. Is there how can other people support what you're doing, the people who don't live in the Bronx? Um, we had a bookstore upstate New York host, uh, a book drive for us. And it yeah. came with two, two, um, SUVs filled with books. Um, and there was another bookstore. So those books were in great condition. Katona book, um, Katona reading room out in Katona, New York. Um, Are you looking for book donations? Not right now because okay. we have so many. I just okay. picked up. 300 um, in the Heights. And I also picked up 100 uh, critical race theory from an organization who had leftovers. The lady said she just Googled me and she found it. Found, found me. Wow, okay. Um, okay, so, so you just right, need to go start another GoFundMe so people can help you get your <laughs> no, bus this paint, one, painted. This one still Let's happening. The, the one I had is still happening. Oh, good. Okay. okay, so you're, you have a GoFundMe and we're going to link to that. And people can donate to that and help you get your bus mm-hmm. painted and get you through the winter. Yeah, or they can um, sponsor a bus visit. Mm-hmm. You know, if they are, you know, if they're 
if they know any organization that's doing any community work, any elected officials, um, they can sponsor a bus visit and have the bus, you know, free for the community, or they can buy books by the bulk, where I sell, I sell 100 books for $100, and those books go to, you know, for a Christmas um, event tomorrow, and there's another Christmas event happening um, before Christmas, of course, and people have been buying books by the bulk, where it's 100 books, or a few hundred books, and, you know, they get to um, have some really great books for the holidays. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's, that's like a great challenge to like buy books for, for kids who need books from Latanya, who is, has her three kids and is doing a great job. And it's like double purpose. Okay. Yeah. Don't anybody listening to that, do that. Maybe I need to, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like compelled to do something here, but um, Latanya, this was amazing to talk to you and you are a hero maker. I mean, you are you know you're building in your community and you're providing education inspiration for all those around you and just really we're really grateful and thank you for that analogy of the rubber band because i hope you guys all heard that about you know we have these dreams and we're kind of this tension pulls us in both directions and at some point you have to either let go of the dream or let go of the rubber band and go and go towards mm -hmm. your dream. And I think that's a really powerful picture of, you know, what we all need to do. So thank you for you. Um, saying yes to your dream and for inspiring so many people in your community. And I look forward to just watching you on social media and all the great things that you're gonna do with your uh, mobile bookstore. And maybe we'll see 20 of them in the years to come, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, there's another thing. Uh, someone donated a second box. That's another story for Amazing. another day. That's another, that's a part two that we need to do, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Latanya. And thank thanks, you guys, you. for joining us for this episode of the Hero Makers podcast. I hope you loved it. And uh, share it with your friends. We'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.